Hello. In Lesson 20, we're going to work through the practice final that was included in your telecourse packet. If you have not already worked these problems, you need to stop the tape and go work them before you watch us work through the solutions. I'm going to work the problems covering systems of equations, exponents, square roots, and scientific notation. The first problem on your test asked you to solve the following system using the substitution method. Make sure you use the method that was specified. The first decision that I need to make is I need to solve one of these two equations for one of the variables in the equation. There's four correct choices. However, one of the choices is definitely easier than the other three choices, and that would be to solve the second equation for x, because if I solve either the first equation for x or y, or the second equation for y, I'm going to introduce unnecessary fractions into the solution process. So from the second equation, I can see that when I solve for x, I need to subtract 4y from both sides of the equation. So that's going to give me x equals negative 4y minus 17. So substituting negative 4y minus 17 for x in the first equation, we have uh, 5 times negative 4y minus 17 minus 2y equals 25. Now we have one equation with one unknown, so we can go ahead and solve for y. Distributing the 5, we have negative 20y minus 85, and we still have minus 2y, and this all equals 25. So combining my like terms, negative 22y minus 85 equals 25. Adding 85 to both sides of the equation, negative 22y equals 110, and dividing both sides of the equation by negative 22, y is 110 divided by negative 22, which is negative 5. But remember, we had a system of equations with two unknowns. I know the value of y, I also need to find the value of x. I can use this equation right here to find my value of x. When y equals negative 5, x equals negative 4 times negative 5 minus 17, which is 20 minus 17, which is 3. So it seems like my solution is the order pair 3, negative 5. But you know what the next step is, and that's that we need to check. So if x equals 3 and y equals negative 5, what we need to do is make sure that this ordered pair satisfies both of the equations. The first equation has the variable expression 5x minus 2y. So 5x minus 2y is going to be 5 times 3 minus 2 times negative 5. That would be 15 plus 10, which is 25. And by golly, that's what I wanted, 5x minus 2y to evaluate to. How about the second equation? Well, in the second equation, the variable expression is x plus 4y. So this is going to be 3 plus 4 times negative 5, which is 3 minus 20, which is negative 17. And by George, that's what I wanted x plus 4y to evaluate to. So it looks like we're good to go to state our conclusion. The solution to the system is the ordered pair 3, negative 5. This time, we're being told to use the elimination method. So what we need to do is we need to multiply both sides of one or both equations by appropriate numbers so that when we add the respective sides of the equation, one of the variables is eliminated. I'm going to choose to eliminate y, and I can do that if I create a positive 6 coefficient in one equation and a negative 6 coefficient in the second equation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides of the first equation by 2, and both sides of the second equation by negative 3. Now keep in mind, 
I made two choices here. I chose to eliminate y, and I chose to multiply by a positive number in the first equation and by a negative number in the second equation. When I distribute, I get 8x plus 6y equals 38 for my first equation, and negative 30x minus 6y equals negative 27 for my second equation. So going ahead and adding the respective sides of the two equations, negative 22x equals 11, so x equals 11 over negative 22, which simplifies to negative a half. But remember, my solution is an ordered pair. Let's go back to our original first equation, which was 4x plus 3y equals 19. Let's substitute negative 1 half for x and see what y needs to be. So if x equals negative a half, this equation becomes 4 times negative a half plus 3y equals 19. So that gives me negative 2 plus 3y equals 19 which gives me 3y equals 21, so y is 7. So it looks like our solution is going to be the ordered pair, negative 1 half 7. But you know what the next step is? We need to check. So if x equals negative 1 half and y equals 7, well then the variable expression in the first equation becomes 4 times negative 1 half plus 3 times 7. That would be negative 2 plus 21, which is 19. So we're good to go on the first equation because that's what we wanted 4x plus 3y to evaluate to. And on the second equation, we have 10x plus 2y. So that's going to be 10 times negative 1 half plus 2 times 7. That would be negative 5 plus 14, and yippee that is 9. So both our equations check. The solution to the system is the ordered pair negative 1 half 7. OK, there's one more system question to solve in our practice final. This one they asked us to solve by graphing. Lucky for us, they gave us the equation in slope-intercept form, so we should be able to get these graphs pretty quickly. In the first equation, the y-intercept is the point 0, 3, and the slope is 3. So I can get other points on the line by using rise 3, run 1. Up 3, right 1. Up 3, right 1. But you know what? I'm looking for a point of intersection, so I want a really accurate graph. So I'm going to get several more points before getting out my straight edge. I can also use negative 3 over negative 1. Down 3, left 1. Down 3, left 1. Down 3, left 1. Down 3, left 1. I think I've got all the points I can come up with. So here's the straight edge. And let's connect these points. Now on my other line, the y-intercept is the point 0, negative 7. And my slope is negative 2. I can think of that as 2 over negative 1. That would be up 2, left 1. Up 2, left 1. I can see where my point of intersection is going to be, but I'm still going to go ahead and put plenty more points before I draw my line. Up 2, left 1. So getting out my straight edge, I'm going to go ahead and connect these points. And I feel pretty confident that the solution here is going to be the point negative 2, negative 3. But you know I'm going to check. So let's do that. If x equals negative 2, and y equals negative 3, well then, let's see, 3x plus 3 is going to be 3 times negative 2 plus 3. That's negative 6 plus 3, which is negative 3, which is y, which is what we wanted to happen. y equals 3x plus 3. And negative 2x minus 7, 
that's going to be negative 2 times negative 2 minus 7, which is 4 minus 7, which is negative 3, which is still y, which is what we wanted to happen. y equals negative 2x minus 7. Our solution checks. The solution to the system is the ordered pair negative 2, negative 3. Here's a wordy question. Suppose that you correctly apply the elimination method and the sum of the respective sides leads to the equation 0 equals 0. What does this tell you about the system and what does it tell you about the solution set to the system? Well, when we encounter this 0 equals 0 or 5 equals 5 or number equals same number scenario, that's telling us that our system is what we call a dependent system of equations. So the system of equations is dependent. Now, work, when you're working with two linear equations in two unknowns um, and you have a dependent system of equations, what that always means is that, in fact, both of the equations graph to the same line. So what this tells us about our solution set is that the two equations graph to the same line. So every point on that line is a solution to the system of equations. Now, sometimes people like to use the phrase that there are infinitely many solutions. I'm not a fan of that phrase, but a lot of math teachers are, so you'd probably be pretty safe using that phrase. Here's another wordy question. Write an example of a linear system of two equations with two unknowns that has no solutions. Well, there's a couple ways we could think about this. What happens graphically when the system has no solutions? The two equations graph to parallel lines. So one easy way to come up with a system that has no solution is to just write down the equations for two parallel lines. For example, y equals 2x plus 5 and y equals 2x plus 10. The two lines have the same slope but different y-intercepts, so they must be parallel. Another way we could come up with such a system is we could just say, well, let's just write down any old equation. x minus 4y equals 5. And then let's write down exactly the same left side of the equation, but a different number on the right side of the equation. Well, clearly, this system's not going to have any solutions. There is no pair of numbers that have the property that x minus 4y equals both 5 and 10. x minus 4y can only equal one number. Now, here's a real word problem. Ethan's wrestling coach has advised Ethan's father that Ethan should eat roughly 2,000 calories a day. Unfortunately, Ethan will eat nothing but weenie beans and Frank's Alfredo. Dad has determined that four servings of weenie beans coupled with four servings of Frank's Alfredo totals exactly 2,000 calories. Also, nine servings of weenie beans coupled with two servings of Frank's Alfredo totals exactly 2,050 calories. Let's write a system of two equations with two unknowns that can be used to determine the number of calories in one serving of weenie beans and the number of calories in one serving of Frank's Alfredo. Then solve the system and state an appropriate conclusion. The directions here are pretty specific because there's probably more than one way you could come up with the final answer to this question, but this question's all about modeling with, with a system of two equations and two unknowns, so we need to employ that strategy. So the first thing we need to do is define a couple of variables. Let's let W represent the number of calories in one serving of weenie beans and 
and y represent the number of calories in one serving of Frank's Alfredo. So we have our two variables, now we need two equations. Let's look at the information we were given in the problem. One of the things we were told is that four servings of weenie beans coupled with four servings of Frank's Alfredo totals exactly 2,000 calories. So if we take our four servings of weenie beans and multiply by the fact that there are W calories per serving in weenie beans, and we add our four servings of Frank's Alfredo and multiply by the fact that there are Y calories per serving in Frank's Alfredo, this is going to total 2,000 calories. We were also told that nine servings of weenie beans coupled with two servings of Frank's Alfredo totals exactly 2,050 calories. So this is going to give us 9W plus 2Y equals 2,050. Here is our system of equations. Let's solve. So I think I'm going to use the elimination method. And you know, I could multiply both sides of the second equation by negative 2, but I'm noticing that every coefficient and the constant in the first equation is even. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides of the first equation by negative a half. This is just a choice that I'm making. As long as you employ a legitimate strategy, you can use substitution or elimination, and you can eliminate anything you want if you do do elimination. So when I multiply both sides of the first equation by negative a half, I get negative 2w minus 2y equals negative 1,000. My second equation is 9w plus 2y equals 2,050. And voila, when I add the two sides together, y has been eliminated. So all I need to do is multiply both sides of the simplified equation by 1 7th which is the same as dividing by 7, and I see that W equals 150. I need to also get a value for Y. I'm going to go back to the equation 4W plus 4Y equals 2,000. When W equals 150, what we have is 4 times 150 plus 4Y equals 2,000. So 4y equals 1,400. So y equals 1,400 over 4, which is 350. Let's check. We were told that four servings of weenie beans coupled with four servings of Frank's Alfredo totals exactly 2,000 calories. So let's see, if we take our four servings of weenie beans and multiply by 150 calories per serving plus four servings of Frank's Alfredo multiplied by 350 calories per serving, that gives us 600 plus 1,400, which is 2,000. So our first sentence checks. We were also told that nine servings of weenie beans coupled with two servings of Frank's Alfredo totals exactly 2,050 calories. So if we take nine servings of weenie beans at 150 calories per serving, plus two servings of Frank's Alfredo at 350 calories per serving, this should total to 2,050 calories. Let's see, this is 900 plus 3 plus 450 is 1,350 plus 700, this is 2,050. It checks. So let's state our conclusion. One serving of weenie beans has 150 calories 
and one serving of Frank Salfredo. has 350 calories. Alrighty, let's move on to the next section, exponent square roots and scientific notation. Let's just quickly work through these problems. 3 to the negative 2. 3 to the negative 2 is the same as 1 over 3 squared, which is 1 ninth. Negative 3 squared. That's the same as the opposite of 3 times 3, which is negative 9. 7 plus 5 to the 0. That's the same as 12 to the 0, which is 1. Negative 7 fifths to the negative 1. That's the same as the reciprocal of negative 7 fifths, which is negative 5 sevenths. I suspect some of you may not have gotten all of those correct. Remember, you need to go back and review the topics that you have trouble with. So if this is one of them, go back and spend some more time on exponents. Let's work these two problems. t to the fourth times t to the seventh squared. Using our products to power rule, we can add the exponents on t. This is t to the eleventh squared. Using our powers to power rule, we can multiply the exponents. This is t to the 22nd. How about x cubed over x to the 7th to the 5th? Since the exponent in the denominator is larger than the exponent in the numerator, I'm going to subtract the numerator's exponent from the denominator's exponent and write this as 1 over x to the 4th to the 5th. Now I can distribute that exponent of the 5 to both the numerator and the denominator. So this is 1 to the 5th over x to the 4th to the 5th. 1 to any power is 1. x to the 4 to the 5th, I can apply powers to power, multiply the exponents. This is 1 over x to the 20th. You may have gotten this problem correct using a slightly different root. That's fine as long as you didn't make up any rules along the way. How about 5y to the negative 3? This is a deceptively simple problem, but there is a common mistake people make, and that's that they put the 5 in the wrong place in their final solution. 5 is not affected by the exponent at all. So this is 5 over 1 times 1 over y cubed, which is simply 5 over y cubed. One more scary one. Negative 4x cubed w to the 7th over x to the negative 4, w to the 12th, squared. You may have chosen to first distribute the exponent of 2. No problem with that. I'm going to simplify inside the parentheses first. That's the choice I'm going to make. Negative 4 has no exponent on it inside the parentheses, so it stays in the numerator. The factors of x, the exponent is larger in the numerator. So I'm going to subtract the denominator's exponent from the numerator's exponent, and that gives me x to the seventh in the numerator. The factors of w, the exponent's larger in the denominator. So I'm going to subtract the numerator's exponent from the denominator's exponent, and that gives me w to the fifth in the denominator. This is all squared. Now I'm going to go ahead and distribute the exponent of 2 to the numerator and the denominator and simultaneously distribute the exponent of 2 to the two factors in the numerator. And that was all a long-winded way of saying that this expression equals negative 4 quantity squared times x to the 7th squared over w to the 5th squared. Negative 4 squared is negative 4 times negative 4, which is 16. And using powers to power rule a couple of times, I have x to the 14th in the numerator and w to the 10th in the denominator. Let's do a couple square root problems. There's two things we need to do. We need to rationalize our denominators, and we need to pull out any perfect squares from our remaining radical. So 
in the expression on the right, I could begin by multiplying by square root 2 over square root 2. But there's an easier beginning. And the easier beginning is to note that since both the numerator and the denominator are underneath square roots, I can go ahead and write one great big mondo square root and put 324 over 2 underneath that great big mondo square root. 2 goes into 324 162 times. So now I need to think, are there any perfect squares that evenly divide into 162? Well, the first thought that goes into my mind is that 2 evenly divides into 162. And while 2 is not a perfect square, the number of times that 2 does go into 162 is 81. And 81 is a perfect square. So I, I lucked out. This is the square root of 81 times 2, which is the square root of 81 times the square root of 2. By definition, the square root of 81 is the non-negative number that you square that gives you 81. So that would be 9. So my final simplification is 9 square root of 2. How about the other problem? Well, if I take 14 over the square root of 7, this time I can't divide the 7 into the 14 because the 14's not underneath the square root. So this time I am going to go ahead and play the trick that I'm going to multiply the denominator by the square root of 7 so that the net result in the denominator is going to be 7. And I'm also going to multiply the numerator by the square root of 7 because if I multiply overall by any number other than 1, I won't have the same number that I started with. Alrighty, here I have 14 square roots of 7 in the numerator. In the denominator, I just have 7. Well, you know what I'm seeing? I'm seeing 14 over 7. I could write this as 14 over 7 times the square root of 7 over 1, and 14 over 7 is 2, and the square root of 7 over 1 is the square root of 7. Okay, let's write a couple numbers in scientific notation. The first number is negative 1, 3, 0, 2, followed by six zeros. I think I'm going to put some commas here to help me keep track. When I write this in scientific notation, I need to start with negative 1.302 times 10. Now I need to figure out how many places I need to move the decimal point. In what I've written in my final calculation, the decimal point is right here at the moment. I need the decimal point to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 places further to the right, so I need to multiply by 10 to the ninth. How about 0 0.123450 for 7? Well, in scientific notation, this is going to start as 4.7 times 10 to some power. Right now, in what I've written as my final answer, the decimal point is here. I need the decimal point to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 places farther to the left. So this is, is going to be 10 to the negative 6. Let's perform this calculation and write our final result in both scientific notation and decimal notation. When I'm copying this down, I want to point out the reason why I have all these zeros after the decimal point has to do with significant digits. Technically, if I don't have these zeros after the decimal point, I can only write one digit in each of my calculations, and I don't want to do that. This is going to allow me to write three digits in all of my calculations. Speaking of calculations, the first thing I'm going to do is separate the non-10 factors from the 10 factors. And then I'm going to do some calculating. 3 times 9 is 27. 27 over 2 is 13.5. The exponent on 10 in the numerator is 15 plus negative 7, which is 8. 10 to the 8th over 10 to the 14th, subtracting 14 from 8, is 10 to the negative 6. I don't have this in scientific notation yet because 13.5 is not between 1 and 10. I need this first number to be 1.35. What do I need to multiply 1.35 by to get back 13.5? Well, that would be 10 to the 1. And I still have my 10 to the negative 6 factor. So altogether, in scientific notation, this is 1.35 times 10 to the negative 5, adding those exponents. 
So in decimal notation, I know that the, the 135 is going to be pretty far to the right of the decimal point because of this exponent of negative 5. So I'm going to write my 135 way over here. Right now, the decimal points between the 1 and the 3, I need it 5 places to the left. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 places to the left. I'm going to double check. If I take the decimal point from between the 1 and the 3 and go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 places to the left, I do get the number on my screen. That does it for my part of the practice final. Anne's going to come up next and work the polynomial problems. In this part of the practice final, I'm going to talk about all things polynomial. So we're going to start with reviewing some of the vocabulary of polynomials. We're going to complete a table just to get back into talking about polynomials. So here we have several polynomials. We're asked for the number of terms, the degree, and the coefficient of the first term. First polynomial has one, two, three terms. In fact, this polynomial is a trinomial. The degree of the polynomial, when we have just one variable, is the exponent on the highest power. We have x squared. So this is a second degree trinomial. What about the coefficient of the first term? The first term is negative 2x squared. The coefficient is negative 2. In this case, the coefficient of the first term is the leading coefficient, the coefficient on the highest power of x. The next polynomial, 5 minus x plus x squared plus x cubed has four terms. We have no special name for a polynomial with four terms. Now the degree of this polynomial is 3. We have an x cubed, a third degree term. This particular polynomial is written in ascending powers of the variable. The coefficient of the first term. Well, the first term is 5, a constant term. We could think about this first term as 5 times x to the 0. Remember, this is a 0 degree term. The coefficient is just 5. In this case, the leading coefficient isn't leading. It's the coefficient on x cubed, which is 1. So there's a little bit of a difference between leading coefficients and just talking about the coefficient of the first term. The next polynomial, 5x plus 2. That has two terms. This is a first degree polynomial. I could think of an exponent of 1 on this x. This is just a linear expression. The coefficient on the first term is 5. The next polynomial, 4x to the fifth y cubed plus 2x to the sixth, has two variables x and y. And here we have to work a little bit more to figure out the degree. The first term has both powers of x and y. To figure out the degree of the first term, I add the exponents. 5 plus 3 is 8. The first term is an eighth degree term. The second term is a sixth degree term. The highest degree term is 8, so the degree of the polynomial expression is 8. What about the number of terms? Well, this is a binomial with two terms, just like the more simple binomial 5x plus 2. The coefficient of the first term is 4. The last polynomial is 8. It is a monomial. It has one term, and the degree is 0. As I mentioned above, we could think about this as 8 times x to the 0 power. A constant has degree 0. A non-zero constant has a degree 0. The coefficient of the first term is the coefficient of the only term, which is 8. So what did we do with polynomials? We multiplied them, divided them, added them, and subtracted them, and factored. So let's practice some of that. So here, to find this product, all I'm going to do is use the distributive property. So multiplying x to each term in that trinomial, I get 2x cubed y plus 3x squared minus xy. Just to show you the steps, in the first pro product, x 
times 2x squared y using the associative and commutative properties. I can write that as 2 times x to the first times x squared times y. And just like Steve was reviewing, I add the exponents of x times x squared to get the 2x cubed y. Also, when we worked with polynomials, we liked writing our variables in alphabetical order. This helps us keep track of like terms. Now I have the product of two binomials. I'm still using the distributive property, but the shortcut is FOIL. Product of the first terms, 6x squared. I add the product of the outer terms, that's plus 15x add the product of the inner term, that's minus 2x, and finally add the product of the last terms, that's minus 5. Here, I have some like terms to combine, 6x squared plus 13x minus 5. Again, I have the product of two binomials, but in this case, I have two variables, but the strategy is exactly the same. The product of the first terms, 4x squared. The product of the outer terms is minus 4xy. Product of the inner terms, plus 3xy. And the product of the last terms is minus 3y squared. Here you can see where it does help to write the variables in alphabetical order, because we recognize we have two like terms which can be combined. Now I have the product of a binomial and a trinomial. Here I have to use the distributive property. There's no shortcut. x minus 2 times x squared minus 5x plus 1. I need to multiply each term in that trinomial by both x and negative 2. So I have x times x squared minus 5x plus 1 and I'm going to multiply that trinomial by negative 2 as well. Using the distributive property a second time, x cubed minus 5x squared plus x minus 2x squared. I need to pay close attention to the sign. I have negative 2 times negative 5x, that's plus 10x minus 2. Combining like terms, I have only one third degree term. I have two second degree terms, minus 5x squared, minus 2x squared. That's minus 7x squared. Two linear terms, x and 10x. That adds to 11x. And finally, one constant term. So here's a subtraction problem. We're asked to subtract 3x squared minus x minus 2 from the trinomial x squared plus 2x minus 4. So I'm subtracting 3x squared minus x minus 2 from the first trinomial, which is x squared plus 2x minus 4. And when I perform the subtraction, I'm going to put parentheses around that second trinomial. I put parentheses around the first one, too, but that was just for emphasis. I need to remember to subtract each term in the second trinomial. So getting rid of the parentheses and paying attention to sign, I'm subtracting 3x squared, I'm subtracting the opposite of x, and I'm subtracting negative 2. Now combining like terms, I have minus 2x squared plus 3x minus 2. A division problem. Here I'm dividing a polynomial with two variables by a monomial. And the best way to do this is to break it up into three fractions. I'm going to take each term in the numerator and divide it by the common denominator, xy. And now I'll simplify each one of those expressions separately. So x cubed divided by x, that's x squared. y to the sixth divided by y, that's y to the fifth. I have 5 divided by 1, that's just 5. x squared divided by x is x. 
y to the fourth divided by y is y cubed. Finally, the last term, I have a factor of xy in the numerator, a factor of xy in the denominator. That just simplifies to 1, so I'm just left with plus 3. Now a little bit of practice with function notation. We have the function f of x equals the opposite of x squared plus 4x. We're asked to evaluate f of negative 5. Well, f of negative 5 is going to be the opposite of the square of negative 5 plus 4 times negative 5. This is just like evaluating an algebraic expression. So I have the opposite of 25 minus 20 that's negative 45. We have another polynomial. We're calling it g of x, and we want to evaluate g of 2. So in this case, g of 2 is going to be 4 plus 3 times 2. I'm just dropping in that 2 for x, plus 2 times 2 squared minus 2 cubed. So I have 4 plus 6, plus 8, minus 8, and this just simplifies to 10. Last thing we're going to do with polynomial expressions is we're going to factor them. So when I factor, the first thing I'm going to look for are common factors to the terms in my polynomial expression. Looking at this polynomial expression, I see a common factor of 7 x, or perhaps negative 7 x. I'm going to factor out the negative 7. So I have negative 7 x times x squared minus 9. By factoring out that negative 7, I see I'm left with a binomial factor, which is the difference of perfect squares. And that factors into the conjugates x minus 3 times x plus 3. I've performed this factorization, and it's very easy to check factoring. I'm just going to multiply things out and make sure I get what I started with. So when I perform my check, I'm going to start by multiplying x minus 3 by negative 7x. So I have negative 7x squared plus 21x, and I'm going to multiply that by x plus 3. So using FOIL, giving myself some room, this equals the product of the first terms, negative 7x cubed, add the product of the outer terms, minus 21x squared, add the product of the inside terms, plus 21x squared, and finally the product of the last terms, that's plus 63 x. Notice the x squared terms cancel, and I do indeed get what I started with. So my factorization checks. Let's do another one. x squared plus 12x plus 20. These three terms share no common factors other than 1. So to factor this trinomial, I'm going to try factoring it into the product of binomials. Are there integer factors of 20 that add to 12? 10 and 2 will do the trick. This factors into x plus 2 times x plus 10. Very quick check here. x squared plus 2x plus 10x, that's 12x, plus 20. This factorization checks. Let's factor this one. x squared plus 16x plus 20. Are there integer factors of 20 that add to 16? I can't think of any right off the top of my head, but I'm going to make a table just to check. So I want to write down all the um, integer factors of positive 20 and see what they add to. So 1 and 20, that adds to 21. 2 and 10 adds to 12. That's what we used in the previous problem. 3 doesn't go into 20 evenly. 4 does. 4 and 5 adds to 9. Once I get to 5 and 4, I have a repeat. So I've got a, no pairs of integer factors that add to 16. So this particular trinomial is prime.
Once again, a trinomial. This time I see that my three terms share a common factor. I can start by factoring out the common factor of 3x. That leaves behind 2x squared plus 4x minus 5. Now I want to see if I can factor that trinomial inside the parentheses. Are there integer factors of negative 10 that add to 4? Well, I don't think so. Negative 1 and 10, they add to 9. Negative 2 and 5, they add to 3. There are no other possibilities that I can try, so that trinomial inside the parentheses is prime. But at this point, the expression is completely factored. A quick check using the distributive property, 6x cubed plus 12x squared minus 15x. So my factorization does check. Here's another example. 16x to the fifth plus 250x squared. Again, I see a common factor. 2 is a factor of both coefficients, but there's also a common factor of x squared. So I'm going to start by factoring out that 2x squared. That leaves behind 8x cubed plus 125. Now at this stage, I'm noticing that I have what looks to be the sum of perfect cubes, 8x cubed plus 125. So I'm going to look up or write down on my paper the formula for factoring the difference of cubes. That's not what I have here. I have a sum and the sum of cubes. Now these are two formulas that you really kind of have to know going into your final exam if you're going to be tested on factoring the difference and sum of cubes. So I'm going to work with the formula for factoring the sum of cubes. In this example, a is 2x and b is 5. So I'm just leaving behind that factor of 2x squared that comes with me every step of the way. I have a plus b times a squared minus ab plus b squared. Cleaning things up a little bit, the complete factorization is 2x squared times 2x plus 5 times 4x squared minus 10x plus 25. Now I want to check this. So I have the expression that I just found as my factorization, and I'm going to perform the check. And I'm going to start by multiplying the 2x squared across this binomial, and then multiply the resulting binomial and trinomial. So 2x squared times 2x plus 5 times 4x squared minus 10x plus 25. That's 4x cubed plus 10x squared times the trinomial 4x squared minus 10x plus 25. Now I'm going to have a lot of terms on the next line, so I'm going to make myself some room. Multiplying the trinomial, each term in the trinomial by 4x cubed, I have 16x to the fifth minus 40x to the fourth plus 100x cubed. Now multiplying each term in the trinomial by 10x squared, I get plus 40x to the fourth minus 100x cubed plus 250x squared. Notice what happens to the fourth degree terms and the third degree terms. They all cancel. And I'm left with 16x to the fifth plus 250x squared, which is indeed what I wanted. Another factoring problem. This one won't take quite as many steps. 4x squared plus 12x plus 9. The three terms do not share any common factor other than 1, so I just have to factor. And I'm looking for integer factors of 36, which add to 12. Well, 6 and 6 will fit the bill. So I can rewrite the linear term 
as 6x plus 6x plus 9, and now I can factor by grouping. So factoring out a 2x from the first two terms and factoring out a 3 from the last two terms leaves a common binomial factor of 2x plus 3, leaving behind another factor of 2x plus 3. So in fact, I could write this as 2x plus 3 quantity squared. The trinomial we started with is an example of a perfect square trinomial. I could have recognized that and written down the factorization right away. And just to remind you of what those formulas are, one form of a perfect square trinomial looks like this, a squared plus 2ab plus b squared factors into a plus b squared. That's what we have here where a is 2x and b is 3. And the other form has a minus 2ab term, and that factors into the quantity a minus b squared. So now, let's look at this particular trinomial. The three terms do not share any common factors other than one. But what I'm noticing is both the first and the last terms are perfect squares. Perhaps this is a perfect square trinomial. If it is, then a would be 6x and b would be 5. So what would 2ab look like? Well, that would be 2 times 6x times 5, which is indeed 60x. So this is a perfect square trinomial, and it factors into a minus b quantity squared. A quick check. 6x minus 5 times 6x minus 5 using FOIL. That's 36x squared. The sum of the outside and inside terms, I get minus 30x minus 30x. That's minus 60x plus 25. So I'm going to finish up with solving just a couple of quadratic equations. Now, if we look at this quadratic equation, we see that the trinomial on the left side is the trinomial we just factored. So I can rewrite this left side as that perfect square trinomial. 6x minus 5 quantity squared equals 0. Well, there's only one way the product of two factors can equal 0. In this case, 6x minus 5 needs to equal 0. Solving this linear equation for x, I get the proposed solution x equals 5, 6. But I definitely want to check it. When I check it, I'll check it in my original equation. If x equals 5, 6, then 36x squared minus 60x plus 25 equals 36 times 5, 6 squared minus 60 times 5, 6, plus 25. So I have 36 over 1 times 25 over 36. Notice in my second term, 6 divides into 60 evenly, so that becomes minus 50 plus 25. So I have 25 minus 50 plus 25, and that's indeed 0. So the solution is 5, 6. Here's another quadratic equation. Now when I solve this quadratic equation, what I notice is that the left-hand side is very easy to factor. I can factor out the common factor of 5x, and that leaves behind x plus 8. So there's two possible solutions here x equals 0 or x equals negative 8. But let's check. Checking 0 is easy. 0 plus 0 equals 0. Let's write out our check for 8, or for negative 8. If x equals negative 8, then 5x squared plus 40x is 5 times the square of negative 8 plus 40 times negative 8, 
which is 5 times 64, which is 320, minus 320, which is indeed 0. So we have two solutions. The solutions are 0 and negative 8. One last example. Here, in order to solve this by factoring and using the zero product property, I have to have zero on one side of the equation. So I'm going to start this by subtracting 10 from both sides of the equation. And now I want to see if I can factor the left-hand side. So I'm looking for integer factors of negative 24 that add to 5. Well, let's see what will work here. 8 and 3 are sounding like good candidates, so positive 8 and negative 3, that will work. So I can rewrite 5x as 8x minus 3x, and once I do that, I can factor the left side by grouping. So factoring out 4x from the first two terms and a negative 3 from the last two terms Factoring out that common factor of x plus 2 leaves behind 4x minus 3. Product of those two factors are 0, so either x plus 2 equals 0 or 4x minus 3 equals 0. Solving the two linear equations, x equals negative 2 or x equals 3 fourths. So let me check. I'm going to check both, and I'm going to check in the original equation. So if x equals negative 2, then 4x squared plus 5x plus 4. I'm hoping that this is going to evaluate to 10. So I have 4 times 4, that's 16, minus 10 plus 4. That's 6 plus 4, which is indeed 10. Let me check my other solution. If x equals 3 fourths, then 4x squared plus 5x plus 4 equals 4 times 3 fourths squared plus 5 times 3 fourths plus 4. So this is 4 over 1 times 9 over 16 plus 15 over 4, plus 4, which I'm going to write as 16 over 4, because I know I'm going to need a common denominator. So I have 9 fourths plus 15 fourths plus 16 fourths. Adding the numerators, 15 plus 16 is 31, plus 9 is 40. This is 40 fourths, which is indeed 10. So now stating my conclusion, the solutions are negative 2 and 3 fourths. That ends my part of the practice final. Candace is going to come and solve some more quadratic equations.